Hello everybody and welcome to this, the fourth in our series of public lectures from the Institute of Health and Neurodevelopment here at Aston University. Uh, my name is Gavin Woodall, I'm a professor of neuropharmacology at the university uh, and it's my real pleasure today to introduce a colleague of mine and a friend, Dr Stuart Greenhill. Uh, Stuart's been working here for about five or six years now and he's interested in how our brains react and change to the environment that they're in. And he's going to give us a talk today on the wonderful world of wiring, waves and wandering. Uh, so thank you very much, Stu, and over to you. Thanks, Gav. And thank you, everybody, for turning out today. And hopefully we can take a little journey through why our brains are so interesting, why they're special, why they make us unique in the animal kingdom and how they build themselves up wire themselves together and change as we go through life and in different conditions that people may come across as we grow. So what is a brain? What's in a brain? Every animal has, has a brain of some description, whether that's a collection of single cells or a massive multi-billion, the most complicated object that we can possibly think of, the most complicated thing that we've ever come across as humans. We can start off with looking at the most simple brains. This is Cenorhabiditis elegans on the left-hand side, and he's a tiny little nematode worm. And he's unique in the scientific world in that scientists have mapped out every single cell, every function of every single cell that exists in that worm. So we know that he's got 302 neurons. We know what each and every one of those neurons corresponds to because we've mapped out the function. And every single C. elegans is the same. All those neurons will wire themselves up to exactly the right place and do exactly the same thing. So in terms of being able to do mutation studies, in terms of being able to figure out how a single gene or how a single protein will change the function of a rudimentary brain, C. elegans is one of the most studied creatures in all of science. A little bit up from that, we've got the common housefly. Now, houseflies don't have brains that we'd recognize as being brain-shaped, but they do have what we call mushroom bodies. A lot of flies have these mushroom-shaped uh, uh, kind of collections of neurons in their head. And flies are really clever. I mean, as anybody that's tried to stop a fly, catch a fly, swat a fly, will find out. You have to get up pretty early in the morning and be pretty quick on your feet to be able to swap that fly or get it out your bedroom or wherever you're trying to get it. And that's because not only have houseflies got these rudimentary brains that will help them navigate the world, but they've got hardwired connections between their eyes, their wings and their legs. So the fly, its visual system is relatively rudimentary, but it can recognize when something is looming over it, when something is taking more than a particular section of its vision up. And without the fly really thinking about anything, what happens is that its wings start flapping and its legs start springing and off the fly goes. So the fly getting away from your newspaper is in fact something like a reflex reaction. The fly doesn't know anything about it. So even with brains, there are still other bits of the body that are effectively reflex wiring that create complicated behavior that the fly has no control over whatsoever. If we go to our friend the rat, and of course, you know, in the lab and in science in general, the idea of lab rat is something that's, you know, widely known. The rat has a surprisingly large and surprisingly complicated brain. Um, your average, your average house rat has twenty million or so, uh, twenty billion, I should say, neurons, and so they they have you know, relatively large brains, they've got lots and lots of cells, but most of those cells, as in most cells in most creatures, are squashed towards the back of their brain. So if we think about our brains, we always think about the large cerebrum at the front, where all the action is, what makes us so clever, so different. But something like three quarters of the neurons in our brain are at the very, very back in the cerebellum, in the place that controls our balance, controls our fine motor skills. And it's the same with the rat, it's the same with cats. Most of their neurons are not in the bit of the brain that we think as the brain. Nevertheless, they've got lovely complicated brains that can do very, very special things. For example, the rat is one of the best creatures to study synaptic plasticity in because it perceives the world with its whiskers. Rats and mice have evolved to live in burrows, live under the ground, crawl their way through sewer tunnels and tight little dark spaces. So their vision's not much caught. 
their olfactory system's fine, their hearing's fine, but the way they really see the world is through their whiskers. And they run around whisking at about 10 times a second, feeling their way through the darkness. And that means that a massive chunk of their brain, about a sixth of their brain, is dedicated to processing the sensory information that comes through their whiskers. We'll circle back to that in a bit. But what it means is that with a simple haircut, we can actually change the wiring of the rat's brain and study plasticity in a way that lets us create treatments for things like stroke and rehabilitation studies. And then we get to the human. It's a very standard issue human on the right-hand side here. And we've got something in the order of 100 billion neurons. It's difficult to count. No one's sat there and, and taken the brain completely to pieces and, and gone one by one by one. Some people will tell you that it's 80 billion. Some people will tell you it's 110. But fundamentally, we've got about 100 billion neurons. And again, most of them are squashed back into our cerebellum at the back of our brain. What we have as humans is a relatively powerful general processor. Our sensory systems are fine. We've got a decent visual cortex. We've got a tiny little olfactory bulb that nestles underneath our brain, so our sense of smell isn't very good. And everything's pretty average. But we have evolved as creatures to have this enormously uh, complicated sensory integration and processing system. So most of our brain, instead of like other animals, like the rat, whose brain is mostly taken up by sensory processing, most of our brain is processing the information that that sensory processing area is feeding forward. So we call them association areas. And we start to add layers and layers of complexity onto the information that we receive from our senses. And that means that we can do all kinds of decision making, have complicated memories, and plans about things. But it also means, most critically, most crucially, that we can talk to each other, that we can communicate. There's no other animal that has such an elaborate system of communication, and certainly uh, none that we know of that can write things down and pass them so clearly from generation to generation. And that means as humans, we don't have to start from scratch. We can teach each other what we know about maths and language and science and history and geography. And so we've got this massive advantage as people there is a cost of that, which comes with effectively childhood. Our brains now are about as big as they can be. If, if a baby's brain was any bigger, we'd have to change the geometry of our hips because we wouldn't be able to have babies. Their heads would be too big. And the price of that is that our brains aren't ready when we're born. We have to go through a period of maturation. We have to go through a period of creating links between the areas of our brain and then breaking them down again. And then once we've done that, we start to pattern the activity of these areas. We start to add on memories and skills and refinement. And the mechanism of doing that we refer to as synaptic plasticity. And it's something that underpins almost every part of our body's processes and every bit of our learning and our memory. Although we like to think that we are unique in our cognitive abilities, there are plenty of creatures that can quite surprisingly solve problems and do complicated things that we wouldn't normally give them credit for. So everybody has probably heard the phrase bird brain before, which is usually uh, not a very nice way to talk about somebody and, and sort of suggests that they're not very bright. But if we look at a lot of birds, yes, they may be small and yes, they may have small brains and yes, those brains may look less complicated than ours. But a crow, for example, has an incredibly dense brain. And I don't mean dense in the, in, in the sense of being a bird brain in the common way. I mean dense in that their neurons are packed together as tightly as you can possibly imagine, which means that they've got loads and loads for a creature their size, one and a half billion neurons. That means that the crow can go and solve problems. We'll have a look at that in a second. But the corollary of that is the elephant. And the elephant has multiple times, two or three times as many neurons in its head that we do as humans, which is one of the reasons it's got such a big brain, one of the reasons why people say that elephants never forget, because it's got this massive brain in its head. Unfortunately for the elephant, it's not going to solve any crosswords anytime soon, because much of its brain is dedicated to moving its muscles. For example, if you just take the muscles in its trunk, it's got 65 times as many muscles just in its trunk as we do in our entire bodies. And if you think about it, lots and lots of our brain, enormous parts of it is dedicated to helping our lips and our tongue move so that we can express ourselves through language. 
In the same way, loads of the elephant's brain is dedicated to moving its trunk around because it's got this enormously articulable thing that it can use to grab and do all kinds of clever manipulation with. But in order to do that, it needs to dedicate a massive amount of its brain to controlling that big trunk at the front of its head. So even though it's got a nice big brain, most of it is dedicated, again, to either sensory processing or motor movement, but not ours. And not the crows. Crows have been proven very, very recently to be able to build tools out of parts. If you give a crow a bit of food that's been sequestered away in a little box that only can be unlocked if you get a bunch of tools and connect them together and make a sort of giant poking device like they did in Friends so they can get in and knock the food out. And the crow will look around, have a little bit of a poke, have a bit of a think, and it will be made, it will be able to use that constructed tool in order to push the food out and get to it without having to sort of scrap around and destroy things like you might see maybe a dog or a rat doing, the crow will be able to figure this out with its massively dense, massively complicated brain. So we're not the only ones that can solve problems, but we are, as far as we're aware, the only ones that can solve problems to the level that we can and pass on the information that we learn to the next generation in a very, very effective way. And you've got to think about how much is going on in your brain and you've got to think about how many connections you've got between all those billions and billions and billions of neurons in your brain and so i want you to do a bit of a, a thought experiment if you like in terms of thinking about how many dendritic spines how many connections how many uh, links we've got between the, the cells in our brain so if you take everybody in the world just now seven point something billion people you went around very quickly and effectively and gave them 75,000 marbles, 75,000 marbles each, you know, enough to take up a massive chunk of the, the room that I'm sitting in. So every single person, every man, woman, and child, and everybody in between has 75,000 marbles. The amount of marbles in the world would then roughly approximate, roughly equate to how many connections your brain has. It's not, you know, it's as many as the stars in the skies, as many as you, a big number as you can possibly comprehend as a human. And those connections are constantly changing. Those connections are constantly refining themselves. And that is the fundamental basis of learning and thought and navigating the way through the world. What it manifests itself as is changes in the little protuberances that we see on the, the dendrites, as we call them, of our nerve cells. So everyone's seen a kind of diagram of a nerve cell. It's got a body and a big tree branching-like structure coming out the top of it. But those branch-like structures on them contain tiny microscopic little spines, little mushrooms glittering in the dark. And what they do is listen effectively to the signals coming in from other neurons. Or the neurotransmitter that's released by the neurons that connect to our neuron of choice are picked up by receptors, little proteins, in the membrane of the dendritic spines that are sitting on the dendrites. And the bigger those spines are, the more receptors that are in them, the wider their neck, and the more of them that are clustered into a particular area of that cell, the stronger the connection that we've got between the previous cell and the cell that it's talking to. And depending on how much activity that that previous cell has been exhibiting and how much of an influence it has on the activity of our cell of choice, that will increase. More and more proteins will be added. More and more spines will be added. The neck will get bigger and more and more efficient transmission will take place. The reverse is also true. If we have a cell that's just chatting away nonsense and it's not really saying anything of any benefit or it's not saying anything at all, a lot of the time, we'll just turn down the connection. We'll pull out the proteins. We'll make the spine smaller. And that's happening all the time. That's happening absolutely constantly throughout the entirety of our life. It's happening to you right now, whether you like it or not. Even if you're not learning anything as you move through the world, you're forming memories. You're looking at new things. And your dendritic spines are changing and churning all the time, processing that information and deciding what's important and what's not. 
So we've got to start at the beginning and we've got to think about how our brains grow and how they're built. And how they're built is very similar to how we build a big tower block or something like that. You'll start off by making a central column, a big tube all the way up the middle. And then you'll add floors and windows and carpets and wiring and all the bits that make a building a building. And the brain is the same. The brain starts as a tube that folds out from a flat layer of cells as we transition from an embryo onwards. It's the same with all creatures with something approximating a brain. It will start off as a tube and it will proliferate and swell out from that middle bit and make more and more elaborate structures on top until we've got a brain. But what it does is build itself from the inside out. So we start off making a whole layer of neurons that will then navigate their way out. And then we'll make another layer of neurons that will navigate their way out further and further and further until we build our brains. And that's great. But what we end up with then is effectively a massive blank disc. All that effort, all those months of growing in, in utero and building this brain, it's still relatively useless. So what we've got to do is start to pattern that brain and start to use that synaptic plasticity, that change in the way that the brain cells talk to each other, those shrinking and growing of those dendritic spines, to turn our blank disk, our unformatted drive, into something we can use, into something that will process the information that's coming into it. And so what we do is we format it by input. We have eyes and ears and somatosensory sensations from all over our body. And what they do is they feed in through the spinal cord or the thalamus, the cranial nerves, wherever they're coming into and get relayed to the relevant part of our brain's cortex. And what happens is that as the brain's cortex receives the sensory information, it wires itself up using plasticity to be able to receive and process the information that is being sent to it. So our visual cortex will receive input from our eyes, even in the womb. And what that does is pattern it into what will become a mature visual cortex. If we are unfortunate enough to have a lazy eye, many of you may have had it yourself. You might know somebody at school who has a lazy eye and they've had a, an eye patch or something over their eye in order to, to cure it. There's generally nothing wrong with their eyes. What's happened is that their brain hasn't quite wired itself to listen to both eyes simultaneously in the way that it needs to. So what happens is that we've got what's called a critical period, a period where the visual cortex is still figuring itself out. It's still receiving information from the eyes and patterning itself. And that happens through quite a lot of our childhood. If we can catch that mismatch between the power of the eyes, catch that lazy eye, and intervene early enough. By covering the strong eye, the brain is forced to rewire itself to pay more attention to the eye that's left uncovered. And by doing that for just long enough, we can fix the disparity between the processes of the two eyes. In the same way, if we go back to our friend the rat, as it's listening to the information that's coming in from its whiskers, those whiskers up through the thalamus and the brainstem will innervate the cortex and the cortex will grow little shapes in it that are effectively areas of really, really dense nerve cells, really dense neurons. And those areas will recapitulate the pattern of the whiskers on the rat's face. If you take the, the brain after the rat dies and you, you slice it up and you stain it and look at the density of the neurons, the pattern in the brain is exactly the same as the pattern on the face. What that means is that we can take a, a rat or a mouse and, and give it a haircut. And if you leave one of their whiskers behind, what happens is that the brain repatterns itself most of the way through life. And so the area that that one whisker um, that's left behind is innervating will expand and expand and expand. And it's much like if you were in an accident or you had a stroke and you, you lost the function of part of your body or part of the part of your brain the other parts of your brain will take over. They will adapt themselves to compensate either for the bit of the brain you, that you've lost, or if you've lost a function of your body, the bit of your brain that once 
um, govern that function will give itself up and take something else over. Nothing's really wasted in our bodies. Everything's kind of recycled and reused because that's energy efficient. In fact, our brains are remarkably efficient. If you think about all this processing going on, we only use about as much energy in our brains as a 20 watt light bulb, which is a, you know an old school dim light bulb, which is remarkable if you think about it. So once we've patterned ourselves, once we've made the kind of basic connections between our sensory systems and the brain itself, we can start getting on with the process of filling it up full of information. And counterintuitively, a lot of that is done via getting rid of lots and lots of connections all at once. We go through lots and lots of periods in our life where we have a kind of Marie Kondo moment. We have a clean out of all the connections in our brain and we, we prune lots and lots of our synapses. We cut away all the stuff that we're not really interested in. And five or six times sometimes, it depends who you ask, through life we have these pruning events where the spines are kind of pulled in and discarded and recycled as stronger spines somewhere else. And that happens in a very predictable fashion. In fact, it happens differently, depending on how you investigate it, it happens differently between males and females. It can happen differently in people with certain conditions, such as schizophrenia. And it happens not necessarily in the same way as we are developing cognitive function. So when you're a kid, when you're a baby, um, lots and lots of things are all wired together. Everything's kind of wired up all at once. And life is a kind of, you know, massively interesting kind of psychedelic trip. All of our senses are talking to each other. Everything's kind of connected as possible in order to get as much information circulating through our brain as we can. And if you think about it, that makes sense. Even the receptors, even the channels in our brain are wired to be as exciting as possible. Even the ones that are normally inhibitory later in life are switched around because of the way that the, the um, gradients of ions work to be excitatory. And so our whole early life is getting as, you know, as excited and, and activity led as possible to get as much information around the brain as we can and build as many connections as is possible. And we're building more and more synapses as we go. What happens then is that we go through this enormous kind of extinction event, just as we're going through childhood and just as we're hitting puberty, just as we get to adolescence, we have this enormous pruning system. So if you're a teenager, if you know a teenager, you have to be nice to teenagers. Teenagers have just gone through this enormous event where they've lost a vast amount of connections in their brain in order to set themselves up as adults. In doing that, they kind of fix themselves in the state that they're going to be. So that's when you lose your critical periods. That's when you lose your ability to reprogram how your eyes are weighted in your brain, for example. But your brain is then mature. Everything's been set up. It's all booted up. It's all ready. And we're ready to fill it full of information. So we've got this marvelous period of our 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s where we've still got the, you know, all the neurons that we had, all the connections that we've got. But we're at the peak of our cog cognitive function and filling our brains up with information. So what you've got to think about is that our brains spend the first you know, several years of our life just sort of chattering to itself and wiring itself up. And then we get to puberty and we lose lots and lots of brain cells, uh, brain cells connections rather. And then we use that mature brain to fill up with information and make our way around the world. Now, like I say, there's differences in how this happens in people with different conditions. If we think about, for example, someone with schizophrenia, they might have a different way of dealing with plasticity as they grow. And what we see is that the mechanisms of plasticity change through life. And sometimes those mechanisms drop out and are only apparent that they've dropped out by the time we reach adolescence, which is possibly, some scientists think, one of the reasons why we see an increase in psychiatric conditions as we go through adolescence and into early adulthood. 
It all comes down to these pruning events. It all comes down to plasticity and these little connections between our brain cells. If we don't prune, we can have some really quite interesting superpowers. So I'm sure many of you will have come across the concept of synesthesia, of somebody who, when they hear a word or they are reading, they see that word or hear um, that word as a particular color, or they might taste words in their mouth. You can have all kinds of links between your senses. And that is because as we transition from early infancy to childhood, those trippy connections that we've got in our brain that wire up our visual cortex to our auditory cortex and make everything hyper-connected, they start to tail off. They start to, to be pruned away. If they're not, we end up with synesthesia. We end up with a connection between two parts of our brain that in normal uh, development would be reduced. And so it usually tends to lead to people who are fantastically creative. An example, we've got Billie Eilish, we've got Nikola Tesla, inventor of the world, and noted composer Franz Liszt. All of these guys were synesthetes. They had connections in their brain that, that most people don't have. They've got the ability to link up their different senses and, and see the world in a very different and creative way. And there's a fantastic book, Wednesday is Indigo Blue, if you want to track it down, that looks at different cases of people with synesthesia and describes how they see the world. Usually they've got some kind of creative bent or they've got a fantastic memory because they can add all this context to the information that they're seeing. And so everything's kind of like a wonderful three-dimensional film. What that's done is, is inspired a whole heap of literature and a whole heap of um, music and films and, and computer games. In fact, back in the day, one of the one of the really good games you could play on your PlayStation 2 was Res, which was based on this notion of synesthesia and, and people being able to go through this magical virtual world where everything was linked up, all the music and the visuals and everything like that. So it's a kind of superpower, but it's formed from an inability to cut the connections in your brain. What we can do is try and boost connections in our brain. So what we can do is try and look into how we can tinker with the plasticity of our neurons in order to try and intervene in incidences where perhaps something has gone awry, in stroke, for example. And so over the last few years, um, a lot of my colleagues and, and in some part myself have been looking at the actions of genes and receptors um, which gate plasticity. And one of the things that we come up with was this notion that the protein that actually helps the HIV virus swing its way into white blood cells is a regulator of plasticity. And if you knock it down or knock it out or give you um, some drugs to, re to reduce its function, it seems to boost plasticity. It seems to increase the propensity of cells to talk to each other. Now, that always comes at a cost. A lot of the time, the cells might not be able to process information in the same way. A lot of the time, the cells might be more predisposed to keel over under extreme circumstances. But what it means is, in the hands of the right people, that we can develop drugs and interventions to help people recover more quickly from stroke. All this came to a bit of a controversial head, and it's, it's kind of continuing. When... Um, somebody tried to, to do gene editing on babies to reduce the amount of CCR5 or to get rid of the amount of CCR5 in their body in order to make them immune from HIV infection. And of course, it was highlighted to the, the guy who's now in jail um, that this would also change their synaptic plasticity and, and mess with their brains in a in a kind of unpredictable fashion. And he said that, you know, he, he knew about this, but he, he wasn't bothered and he was going to continue. And continue he did, and he threw him in jail. So we have to be careful how we mess with synaptic plasticity. We have to be careful about the changes we make to our brains. Because our brains are so complicated, we don't really have an idea of everything that's going to happen when we do an intervention or a perturbation, because it's based on activity on top of activity of activity. And so we like to be able to intervene, but we've got to intervene slowly. 
and carefully and change things in a manner that's not going to have too many unforeseen consequences. So how do we form these memories? Well, think about leaving your house in the morning. If I go back and visit my folks um, and, and stand on their front doorstep, it takes everything in my power not to trot off down the road to the bus stop to go to school because I did that for six years. And so standing there and in that context and the visual information that's being presented to me gives me the impetus to go and follow the route that I would normally follow because a lot of our brain is built on maps and a lot of our brain is dedicated to the formation of those maps. If you think about it, a lot of the way that you think about things, a lot of the way you memorize things, you start off with the location. And so what we do when we navigate through the world is we have little cells in um, a particular parts of our brain that ping off as we move. As we're moving, we're generating oscillations, we're generating brain waves. And those cells will fire at regular intervals, depending on how we're going around the world. And we have maps of rooms, we have maps of our immediate environment, and we have maps of the entire world. You know, wherever we've been, we'll be able to form a map in our head of how we are navigating around it. Now, of course, we're not born with them. We have to form them ourselves. So as we're navigating around a brand new environment, our brain is in a different mode. Our cells are undergoing a different form of plasticity than normally what would happen where we know where we're going and we're adding kind of um, historical memories to the map that's already in our brain. So there are cells in our brain that represent particular people, for example. Most famously, somebody recorded the cells from the brain that represent Jennifer Aniston, particularly, called Jennifer Aniston cells. Um, each person in our story will occupy a neuron or so in our brain. Those neurons, of course, will be linked to the maps that we're making of the world. And so if I think about my fifth birthday, I had it at my grandma's house, um, which I have a picture of in my brain. I, I had a, a green Slimer cake from Ghostbusters, and I've got an image of Slimer. And I had my friends and family there, and each one of them will have a little neuron in their, my brain that will fire off a signal. And we all bring that together, and that forms a memory. But the fundamental aspect of it is adding waves and spikes and information to the maps that we're creating of the world. So what we've got, for example, is a theta wave. And as we move through the world, we generate theta waves in our brain. And as that theta wave um, continues and we move about, the cells that represent maps in our brain will fire. And they fire faster and faster and faster compared to the, the phase, if you like, of, of the wave in question. And we call that phase procession, by the way, the technical term. But all that made together starts to generate maps in our brain. And so we can see uh, this video that's about to come up here. Here is a rat in MIT, Massachusetts Institute of About 10 ish years ago, they did these experiments. And he's running around a maze. Um, and he's got a little cap on his head that's recording the activity of his brain. And those flashes you can see appearing at the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. And that little kind of crackling noise you can hear in the background is not my microphone. It's the rat's brain. If you notice, the maze is kind of colored differently in different places as the rat moves around it. And that's because the rat's brain is responding to its location in three-dimensional space. It's painting a picture of the maze that it's going through and coming up with a particular sequence of firing to describe that maze. Now, that rat will go to sleep after this experiment. You know, he'll come to the end of the long day and they'll, they'll put him back in his own cage and he'll have a dream. What he dreams is the maze. He will play that maze backwards in his head over and over and over again and rehearse it. And then the next time he comes to the beginning of that maze, because it's in the same room, because he can see the same landmarks, like standing on the doorstep of your parents' house, he will play that maze in his head over and over and over and run 
round the maze and reinforce the activity that his little mind map has made. And so that's what we do as well. That's why I want to go to school every time I stand on my parents' doorstep. It's not because I really, really want to go back to my school. My school's not there anymore. They moved it. So I'd be on a hiding to nothing at the end in somebody's flat. But it's because my brain is wired to see the context of the outside of my parents' house and know that most of the time I will go down to the bus stop and go to school. And you will do the same. Sometimes you will be in a very familiar environment and it's almost impossible to do the things that you'd normally do when you were in that environment. And as we move through the world, we're adding more and more contextual memories, adding more historical memories to the maps that we've made in our brain. And we convert those maps into longer and longer term memories by going to sleep. Sleep is one of the most important aspects of memory. It's one of the most important aspects of our brain. Everything sleeps that we know of that has a com complex enough brain. Even birds that are migrating thousands of miles, even dolphins will sleep. They may sleep one half of their brain at a time, but they will sleep. Everybody needs to sleep. And so how it works is we may take a trip. Let's go to Madeira, lovely Madeira. And we'll wander around Madeira. Maybe we've never been there before through the streets of Funchal and all that kind of stuff. Um, and build a little map of Madeira in our brain. Now, at some point during our trip, something memorable might happen to us. Say we, we went outside the, the shop or wherever we'd gone, the cafe in Madeira, and we bump into Cristiano Ronaldo. Hello, Cristiano. How are you doing? Um, we'd remember that. I mean, most people would remember that if you've got any passing interest in, in football. Um, and we'd place that in the context where we'd met him. So outside that particular shop in Funchal or whatever, on the way back from the funicular on the way to dinner. And we'd go, that's nice. And we'd probably text our mum or whoever and say, well, we met Cristiano Ronaldo. It's, it's, it's very, very, uh, very, very memorable. Very interesting thing. What happened? What we then do is make a kind of priming pattern in our brain of that memory. So we've already, because we recognize and got a representation of this dude in our brain, we've formed a map of Madeira in our brain by the mechanism that we just saw. And now we're going to squish them together. And every time we think of Madeira, we'll think of Cristiano Ronaldo. And every time we think of Cristiano Ronaldo, we'll think of Madeira. So how do we do that? Well, we will sleep. And we will play some of that again back in our heads in, in some kind of dream. Most of us will dream every single night. Every time we drop through the stages of sleep into REM sleep, we'll have a dream. Most of the time you don't remember it. It would appear that you only really remember your dreams when you're woken, when your sleep is disturbed. Anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to play back this memory. We're going to shift our synapses around a little bit. We're going to change the weighting of our dendritic spines, if you remember them. And we're going to fix this memory in our brain. A little bit like when we used to have um, old school film cameras and you'd have to go down boots or snapping snaps or whatever and have it developed and, and come back into pictures. And then every time we remember stuff, we'll, we'll build back this memory from scratch, like playing with... Uh, playing with our Slovenian families or whatever when, when we're kids. And that's how I remember my fifth birthday. That's how I, I remember what happened. I have an idea, sort of, of what my grandma's house looks like and my mum and my dad and my brother and my grandma's and all that. And what the cake was and things like that. But every time I remember it, it's kind of made up from scratch, like a scene in the theatre. And what that means is that we don't always have a perfect recollection of what we've done we do our best and if it's something that's really important to us is if it's somebody that we live with or someone that we've got a you know a long um and storied history with and we'll have a fine recollection of what they look like and what they sound like and what they do similarly if it's somewhere that we've been a lot and that we've got this very definitive map of because we've experienced it and slept and experienced it and slept we build up this picture in our head if it's someone we've just met and it's someone that we've we've got no sort of um, history with, sometimes it can be a bit difficult, which is why you come back to somebody and you're like, oh, you know, yeah, I, I recognize you, but I can't remember your name or vice versa. We haven't formed strong enough connections in our brain yet to adequately remember that every time from every little perturbation. Because the stronger the connections, the more likely it is that our cells are going to fire when the cells before them get active. 
And so there's lots and lots of controversy in the literature around the world about how sleep develops in our in our brain. Um, and so what we see is that things go up and down and left and right all over the place when we sleep. Some people will tell you that the um, all this all the synapses will be constantly squeezed down during sleep. Everything's going to get smaller and smaller and we'll lose lots and lots of dendritic spines. Some people will tell you that it's only a subpopulation. And some people will tell you that this replay stuff we just saw is in fact the absolute proof that the opposite is true, that everything gets strengthened in sleep. The actual story is probably more complicated than that. But what it means is that we know that sleep is essential. We know that it is the thing that turns your daily life into long-term memories. We know now more, thanks to the work of um, scientists who've used, uh, for example, proteins from algae to make brain cells be able to turn on and off with laser light. We know that memories aren't just made in your hippocampus in the short term and then fed to your frontal cortex in the long term, as we once thought that in fact they might be made in both places at the same time. And it's only the ones that we strengthen and, and modify through re repetition and sleep that get stuck in there long term, which is why those of you who might want to be revising for an exam at the moment, or you've got something up and coming where you've got to remember stuff, the best way to do it is to do it little and often. Do it for half an hour a day, and then get a good night's sleep, because that's how you form memories. Cramming stuff in will work for the short term. I mean, all of us have been running around the house um, reciting phone numbers to ourselves, for example, to try and get from one place to the other. But it only works very briefly. In order to remember those things, we usually have to repeat them and then go to sleep and repeat them and go to sleep. There's ways around that. The guys with synesthesia, for example, can build these vast connections in their brain through the context that they've got but not everybody can do that. So oftentimes your Darren Browns and your people that will give you tips about how to remember decks of cards or whatever, they will tell you to imagine a physical space, a mind palace, if you like, full of random information because that builds a map in your brain. It builds a fake map in your brain. And that means we can associate all the stuff that we want because we're just imagining it with that map, which means that we're wandering through our fake little map that we've made in our brain and remembering all the stuff that we've added to it, which increases the likelihood that we'll recall it because everything comes down to maps effectively. So what we can do is use all this knowledge, use all this finesse that we've got over the, um, the way that we can um, control our brains to make sense of conditions like epilepsy and schizophrenia. So, for example, people like me and Gav in the lab, what we'll do is we'll take a tiny glass needle shaped like a pencil. And this tiny glass needle will have a little tiny hole at the end. And what we'll do is we'll attach that little needle to the membrane of a brain cell. And then there's a little tube attached to the end of that glass needle and we will suck it open. Put it in the mouth and suck open the membrane of the brain cell. And that means that we can do a whole bunch of things with it. We can fill it with dye, so it'll become fluorescent, and we can visualize it. These are real human neurons taken from um, brains that have had uh, parts cut out of them to treat various conditions. Um, we can make electrical recordings of their activity. We can listen to every little bit of electri electrical signal that's coming into that brain cell. Or we can keep the, the slices going for a week or so in order to add drugs to it and watch how those connections change in a condition like epilepsy, for example. And by understanding how we change, how our brains rewire, how that process of plasticity changes the function of a neuron from firing away to generating a seizure, we can come up with more and more ways to help people with those conditions. We can understand how the receptors work, how the networks are rewiring themselves, and have more and more understanding of what we can do to try and make their lives easier. So I'm going to 
pull off the the slides now, and I think me and Gav are uh, going to have a bit of a bit of a chat. If we can bring him back. Hi, Stu. Thank you very much for that uh, fascinating talk. Uh, sitting there listening to it, uh, well, I've got a couple of things to. Uh, to say, and that is, if, if anybody's got any comments, we've had a bit of a problem with the uh, with the chat. Um, if you refresh your browser, I think that will probably work. Uh, also, you can tweet to at IHN uh, and see if that works as well. But Stu, listening to that, um, at, at my age of of, uh, uh, of life, I, I'm wondering um, why isn't my brain full uh, of all these memories, uh, and, and can it get full? Can, can you can you end up filling? up completely and not have any ability to remember anything else is that well, actually i suppose you could but um our brains are really really clever so the sound so we've only just scratched the surface because obviously it's a you know it's a, a, a sort of introductory lecture to the thing but our brains have an ability to kind of elastically change the um the activity of individual cells within it so if you imagine if you if you walk down the street um, occasionally somebody will drive past you with an exciting stereo system on which they're playing something delightful, I'm sure. And all you can hear is that bush, 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 because it's so saturated that there's no kind of nuance to it. And our brain cells, the connections within them, if they get strong enough, if they get um, increased enough by lots of activity, can reach that level of saturation so we lose the nuance. So what happens, especially during sleep, is that our our brain cell will turn down all its connections. So stay the waiting of all the, the dendritic spines was nine or 10. We can keep our um, connections the same kind of relative waiting, but give ourselves more room by turning everything down. So the whole cell will turn down its volume. So everything's four or five or six. And our cells during that period where we're little and we're setting up all the connections come across a sort of, set point it's like the argument over the the thermostat that i'm sure everybody has when when we go home our cells want to be a particular level of activity and if they deviate too much from that particular activity as a whole they can turn all the cells all the synapses down or they can turn all the synapses up to make sure that we don't lose that cell forever because if it gets too quiet and and too difficult to excite then we'll never be able to um, excite it again. So your brain may well fill up one day, I can't guarantee that it will, but it does have a bit of housekeeping that it does in order to make sure that our, our brain cells, our neurons, have that capacity pretty much for life. We call that homeostatic plasticity. It's a very new concept. It was only discovered about 20 odd years ago, um, but it seems to be one of the most important mechanisms in keeping our brains healthy and keeping our memories nice and sharp. Okay. Well, thanks very much for that, Stu. I mean, it's, it's a fascinating answer as well. I've got a question here uh, from Sai, and he says, what a great insight to the topic. Um, can we stimulate our brain connections in a way that makes it so that we don't forget the memories? Ah, okay. Um, yes. It, do you know what? It's much like every other answer. Unfortunately, the world and the internet especially is 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 made on kind of shortcuts yeah take take wear these pants or take this pill and you, and you look just like george Cooney. but i've been wearing the pants and taking the pills for a long time and it's it's yet to have any effect unfortunately so there's always sounds like there's going to be a quick fix and i'm sure you could give give a lot of things a go but the 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 risks would far outweigh the benefits the only way that we know of that's really guaranteed to stimulate your connections in the way that you don't forget is repetition and recall. And this is something that that even extends to people who have um, started to develop dementia, for example. You can have um, it's kind of memory play, if you like, where you'll show them old photos and, and try and stimulate the memories that they've got and they will come back. They will, they will be able to sort of remember some more stuff than, than triggered by these uh, photographs and it's the same with you so if you want to remember something just keep looking at it and then come back to it later don't try and sort of read it all and, and memorize it there are some people who can do that but their brains generally pay some other price for it maybe they've got difficulties in in social interaction or something else um what the only the only answer is to keep the cells firing and do it again and again and again and again whether you're doing anything you know trying to learn a script for um, your TV debut 
or learn a, a piece on the piano or your French homework, whatever, the only way to do it is repetition. It's the same way, the only way really to, to lose weight is to, to go running and eat broccoli. I'm afraid I don't know anything about those two things. Um, we've got another question here from Rich Osborne, and he says, do you have any links to the research that you mentioned about short-term versus long-term memory and the fact that oh. they might be together? So this, is, this isn't something that I um, pioneered, but it's, it's something really that's, that's interesting to me. It came initially, uh, amongst other people, from a fellow called Susumu Tonegawa, working over in America. And he was somebody who was able to express particular proteins in the brain um, that are gated by activity. So I mentioned algae in the passing. The optogenetics, as we call it, is a really important tool in, in modern neuroscience. So we take the eye of the algae, if you like, algae being little sort of single cell organisms that are halfway between plants and animals. They want to swim up to the top of the pond and, and photosynthesize. To do that, they've got a rudimentary protein, much the same as the, the, the rhodopsins in the back of our eyes that, that sends light. And what we can do is take that gene and express it in a neuron, which means, because they are ion channels, that we can turn those brain cells on and off with, uh, with, with light, with laser light. What happens is that when um, Tonegawa and his, and his chums express this protein in an activity-dependent way, he could shine his laser back in their brain and trigger the memories that the mice and the rats that he was looking at had formed. What we're doing here at Aston is something similar and using optogenetics and, and all that kind of research on, on the patterns of brain activity, but in a more kind of translational way. We're more interested in figuring out how, for example, conditions like epilepsy are based on plasticity. So there's a link there. But what's mostly linked is the kind of adoption of the, the tools that have come out of it. There's a whole, there's a really exciting time to be a neuroscientist. And there's a lot of stuff we can do now that we couldn't do 10 years ago that we're really leveraging to try and make some progress in how we understand various conditions. That's great. Thanks, Stu. Uh, we've got another question here from Jackie. Uh, she asks, uh, how, oh, well, there you go. It's come up in front of you. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, yeah, do all babies experience synesthesia? I, I think the current kind of notion is that obviously we can't ask them, which is a shame. But the, the kind of current notion is, is that they, they may well do. Um, and that all those reflexes that, that we see, in fact, Gav will tell you that he used to poke his kids with, with, with some uh, regularity to find out what kind of intrinsic activity they were uh, the, the experiencing at the time because as you well know if as, as you go through life um babies will change their reflex patterns depending on what stimulus they're receiving and that seems to be relatively stereotyped in fact it's used for developmental milestones so it could well explain why they're so easily overwhelmed it could well explain why they're so easily distracted by by simple things you know jangling keys must be the most exciting kind of beatles uh, video you could possibly imagine um, and it's clear, it knows that it is, it's well known fact that these pruning events do happen. So in order for the, all the connections to be set up in order to be able to be pruned, we have to have a period where lots and lots of stuff is going on. And we know about the expression of the chloride um, transporters and the channels that change things from inhibition to excitation in the very, very young. So... The, the protein knowledge, the cellular knowledge, the network knowledge, and the behavioral knowledge all point to the notion that being a baby is an awful lot of fun for most people. And it's, it's a kind of, sort of enormous multi-sensory trip. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Stu. I've got a question here from Nadia, and she's asking, uh, opposite to memory creation, is there any research into childhood trauma and whether your brain is actively repressing memories? That's a great so, question. It's it is a it's a really good question, and it's it's a it's a function of the the fact the notion that our brains arrived via evolution, and that evolution finished to a certain extent, or 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 came to pass quite a long time ago. So I'm sitting here, I mean, nice willy jumper in a in a room talking to a computer, and and you know dozens of people watching me all at once. <clears throat> 
But of course, my brain is still pretty much the same as when the, the first humans were running around the savanna or, or living, you know, in, in a cave or whatever you want to picture the, the early humans doing. And our brains are wired to remember mostly dreadful things. Because if we don't remember dreadful things, we're not going to live very long. So if I know that I'm not to go into the forest over there because I'll get chased by a saber-toothed tiger, that's an evolutionary advantage. The cost of that is that I feel genuine fear and trauma whenever I go near the forest because it'll keep me away. It'll keep me away from the saber-toothed tiger. Now, it's unlikely between here and the house that there's any saber-toothed tiger um, on the train. But my brain is the same. So emotional trauma, any kind of physical or emotional trauma that we experience as children or otherwise, has a tendency to be remembered better than, every, than, than anything. The fact of the matter is we need to get through life. You know, we, we need to try and, try and be um, as, as happy and healthy and, and, and functional as we can. So we will try and, and continue with those uh, difficult experiences that we've had despite them. Sometimes that will manifest itself as, as PTSD or something like that when we, we can't and we continue reinforcing the memories and it's very, very difficult to, to, to go past what we've experienced. And so what we can do, what some people, can, can, clinicians can do, um, is uh, reprogram or attempt to reprogram uh, the memories by using sort of eye movement. It's almost like a sort of medical version of hypnosis. You can give people drugs and, and move their eyes to, to try and de-trigger, de-separate, if you like, the, the maps from the memories from the emotions. In the same way, repression is probably something akin to, to that aspect in that we've had a strong emotional tag to our memories. Our, our, our stronger memories have a very strong emotional tag. And sometimes if we can work on it and, and depersonalize the situation, you can attempt to, to squash it down and not remember it. But of course, what will normally happen rather than repression is that the mind has a tendency to run over and over and over things that are embarrassing or upsetting to us again and again. If I were to say, you know, some dreadful swear word right now, it's likely that I'd remember it for the rest of my life because it'll be remembered by as a dreadful gaff um, for all involved. And now that I've said it, I really want to say some kind of dreadful swear word. So the brain is a funny thing. Um, but what tends to happen is that we will more likely to repeat unpleasant things than squash them down. But that doesn't mean that that's not possible. However, the, the cellular mechanisms around that are quite difficult to figure out because the studies would have to be done in humans because we can't really ask rats or mice how their repressed memories are going. And of course, we we can't sort of dig into to people's brains and, and put electrodes in them unless we're treating them for, for serious conditions. Okay, thanks again, Stu. Thanks very much. Um, I wonder if anyone else has got any other questions uh, if they want to add them to the chat. I'll give it a few seconds and see if anything pops in. Uh, Stu, uh, while we're waiting, perhaps you could tell us um, why, why most of us can't remember our dreams. Is it just because we're not woken up in the middle of them? <laughs> it would see, if you can imagine, um, many of us uh, struggle sometimes to tell the difference between our uh, internal constructs and, and real life will wander through with a particular view of the world, but that won't necessarily be uh, congruent with what's actually going on. We, we build our little palaces in our mind. So again, it comes back to evolution. If we remembered all of our dreams every night, every time we went through into a REM cycle and back out again, we remembered it all. You know, I'd be coming in looking at people very askance every morning in the office because they've been doing the most bizarre things. And we have to be able to separate out the kind of housekeeping -y, um dream-like state that our brain goes into when we're reinforcing memories and what has actually happened. Um, and so really what's, what normally happens is it's a, bit, it's a little bit like the, the little memory sticks that you put in your computer and you have to, to tell it to stop listening to the memory stick before you pull it out. The brain will dream and then it'll get flush out all memory of that dream in order to do housekeeping effectively, in order to eject the urine. You can now safely eject the disc, which is why you feel much better if you wake up at the right point in your sleep cycle. If you wake up halfway through, if you wake up in REM, then it doesn't matter how long you've been in bed, you still feel groggy. And usually you'll say something unpleasant to the dog 
or the neighbor's or the neighbor's dog or whoever it is that's woken you up at that given moment in time. So what's happened, we remember our dreams because the brain hasn't ejected its disc properly. It hasn't flushed out all that stuff um, because normally our dreams are, are only, you know, tangentially connected to actual reality because we're adding all sorts of random stuff on top of each other in order to get as much information um, cemented in our brain as, as, is, as is possible. So it's probably a good thing we don't remember our dreams every night. Absolutely, I think so. Um, Stu, it's five o'clock. Uh, that was an absolutely fascinating session. Thank you ever so much uh, for that. Uh, and thank you to everybody who's attended. Uh, please do come again to, to our next lecture in the series, which will be in about six or eight weeks' time, uh, and look out for the announcements of who's, who's going to be talking uh, on these public lecture series. So thank you to everybody for, for coming along, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Cheers, folks.